Welcome to The Circuit, Wayne Hills' one and only show for everything tech. I'm your host, William Logan, and this week I have guest speakers talking about mobile games and the future of virtual reality. Before I get to that, here's what's new in the world of tech. Recently, OpenAI's latest creation, ChatGPT, has been stirring up some controversy. It is a type of language model able to generate human-like text by predicting the next word in a sequence. It has the ability to translate text, write original essays, and answer questions. ChatGPT's creation alters the way we think about AI and has made huge leaps in the field of language modeling. In other news, Volkswagen announced their next generation of electric vehicles, the ID7, a fully electric sedan that will be success the successor to the Arteon. The ID7 reportedly has a range of about 430 miles on a single charge. If Volkswagen will go through with this, the US market will see its first non-luxury electric car since the Tesla Model 3. An official price hasn't been announced yet, but, the ID, but if the ID7 is anything like its predecessors, it is expected to cost around $40,000. It seems we are finally moving towards an age of affordable electric vehicles, and the ID7 might be vital for the widespread acceptance of this electric revolution. That was your tech news recap. So sit tight, because after this break, I'll have my first guest speaker talking about the current state of mobile games. Welcome back. I'm here with Marcello Dugdale, who will be talking about the current state of mobile games. So, Marcello, what's your favorite mobile game? Um, so far, my favorite mobile games are uh, definitely uh, Clash Royale and Clash of Clans. They're both made uh, by Supercell, and I love their strategy. I mean, I definitely like to play them in my free time. They're just quick, five, three-minute like strategy games, you know. That's really it. So, mobile games are one of the most popular formats we have today. What do you think uh, led to that mass appeal? Uh, I just think their accessibility, like mm -hmm. I was saying, like they're very easy. Like if I just want to get a quick three minute game in, I could. Like I can get them in between stuff. So definitely their accessibility and usage, because nowadays everyone has a phone. And it's not like I can grab my PC and move it around. As nice as that would be. Uh, so I'm sure all of us are familiar with those annoying ads for those kind of crappy games. So I just wanted to know what you were thinking about the state of mobile game development, where people are trying to output as many games as possible with minimal effort. Like, what do you think, uh, what do you think about that specifically and how do you think we could improve on it? I mean, I understand why they do it to get revenue. I mean, mobile games, like, no one's gonna buy their product so they input as many ads as they can to get a little bit of revenue. I mean, I understand where they're going at, but I think they just need to focus on better quality games more than mass production or maybe have a bunch of worse quality games set into categories. Well, thank you for your time. After this break, I'm gonna have somebody talking about the future of VR. Welcome back. I'm joined with Mason Sneed, who has a few things to say about the future of virtual reality. So Mason, what's your experience with VR? My experience with VR is very long, you could say. I've known about it since I was, I wanna say around 10 years old, I'm about 16 now, six years, I say that's pretty good, one third of my life. Um, and I've seen it develop from this concept to, in the past couple years, m further than any other technology I've really seen. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal at what, the, what they've been able to do with it. So I, I think that makes you pretty qualified uh, to talk about this. Uh, with that, how do you feel the immersion differs between VR and other ways of uh, watching media or taking in media, whether that's games or movies? I'd say the main difference uh, with VR is that instead of like, for example, let's take uh, two video games, but one, like the uh, same video game, but one version of it's in VR, one version of it in uh, like desktop or mm -hmm. just on your computer. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, we'll use No Man's Sky as an example because that's one I like. Uh, no Man's Sky is you travel in a spaceship and colonize planets and your whole goal is to reach the center of the universe. When you're doing that on a desktop, sure it's fun, but you're not really, like in, you're not in the spaceship, you're not flying through the space or anything. But when you're in that headset, you see what your character sees. You're r roaming the planets, you're finding new civilizations you are the one it's like it's you're in the game so it, it just kind of makes it it makes it feel like you're part of the world right yeah i guess you could say that yeah so i think the next question would be uh do you think that kind of level of immersion is dangerous because maybe somebody would become 
kind of disconnected from reality because of it. Do you think something like that could happen? I feel like that has already happened a decent amount. There's a game called VR Chat. Don't play it. Uh, that there's people who spend a lot of their time in it because uh, they VR Chat's essentially a socializing game where you just kind of can go to different places and talk to different people. It's a lot of fun, but like a lot of people say, too much of something is a bad thing. And then eventually you realize that you've been running around doing other things for like 12 hours or something like that. And then, or it's like the next day or something, which is kind of bad, but I don't think it's VR's fault itself. I feel mm -hmm. like that would be more based from on a person to person perspective because it's your job to, you know, self control and manage yourself. Well, I, I, so I could see, I could see why that could be a problem. I mean, people are getting used to socializing in this like other space. Uh, but yeah, like you said, it's probably more of a, if you use it in moderation, it's fine. Of course. So uh, uh, you said you've been watching closely about with the progress of VR. So who do you think the big players are going to be in the next 10 years of VR? So top, top three, I think, would be Oculus, uh, Valve, and Pimax. Pimax is a little lesser known, but they recently came out with, their headsets have been known to be very expensive, but also very, very high tech with very big uh, field of view and 8K resolution per eye, which I don't think you can take into perspective. The average like computer monitor. Can we even see an 8K? I don't uh, even know, <laughs> but that's, it's insane what they've been able to do. Of course it has to be like tethered and it's like $11,000, but it's, it's crazy. And I think that if they keep going, they can eventually make a consumer available headset such as Oculus. The only reason I'm putting Oculus up there is because they were, I believe, one of the first to create inside out tracking, which means you don't need an external uh, piece of hardware to track where the headset is or track where your controllers are. So the benefit of that would be, it would be more like plug and play instead of having to actually figuring out this whole new technology and setting it up in your room. Essentially, yes. And also it would allow uh, not to have to worry about like having a, com a strong computer to play VR because the thing nice thing about the Quest and the Quest 2 which are two consumer available headsets they're both pretty cheap which means a lot more people can buy them which means they're getting more money but also you don't need like a 9 that like an RTX 3080 or something to run them because you don't need a computer and you could have a play space anywhere you don't need to have a specific play space well thank you for taking the time to come on the show uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, that's the circuit, and I'll catch you later.